Hello students, today we are going to be discussing, discussing the current affairs. Uh, the first topic that we have for the day is Prevention of Money Laundering Act. This is a very important act because it is constantly used either by the Enforcement Directorate or by the CBI in order to file and book people under it. Uh, there was also a plea in the Supreme Court recently regarding the misuse of this act because it has been filed against people randomly also. Okay. Money laundering is a predicate offence act which means that it's the offence is also based on other offences. Like say for example money laundering cases can be filed against people for violations of those uh, crimes in the Indian Penal Code or for under Prevention of Corruption Act, under Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act, under Wildlife Protection Act. So all the offences under these particular acts can be charged with money laundering. Because these are illegal acts and the money obtained from these acts when it is tried to be made to look like as though it is coming from a legitimate source. Then it is known as money laundering. Okay. Next, Kajaraho Temple. Uh, so the second topic would be the Kajaraho Temples. And again, not so very important topic. Classical language status. This could be an important topic because uh, these days the civil services prelims exams they are definitely asking questions from art and culture. Uh, last year they asked a question on the Bharata Ratna. And uh, hence this could be an important topic from that particular standpoint. And then the data accessibility policy. Okay. Please remember the data sharing is an important concept when it comes to inventions and innovations. Okay. So, Again, this is another particular important uh, concept, but uh, also remember that this is just a draft policy and hence uh, it is only mediumly important. Once the real policy comes out, please read that definitely then. Then Nord Stream 2 pipeline, again, uh, this has been there in the news, uh, see cucumber not so important. Okay, moving on, the first topic for the day, recently uh, one of the minor, one of the ministers of the Maharashtra state government has been arrested under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act by the Enforcement Directorate. Okay, please remember that the Enforcement Directorate usually enforces only two particular laws. Okay, one is the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Okay, what is the other act? It is the Foreign Exchange Management Act. So, remember that the Enforcement Directorate only enforces these two acts usually. What is money laundering? Money laundering is the process of making large amounts of money generated by criminal activity. Like what I spoke of over there. Let it be through Narcotic uh, Substances and Psychotropic Substances Act or Wildlife uh, Prohibition Act or any of the other illegal activities such as drug use, terrorist funding and appear to have come from a legitimate source. Okay. So whenever money is earned through these illegitimate activities, but then it is being made to look like as though it is coming from a legitimate business by setting up shell companies, then it is known as money laundering. Now, the money generated from criminal activities is called dirty money and money laundering is the process of conversion of dirty money to make it as legitimate money, like it is coming from a legitimate business. Now, now money laundering is a big problem. Because developing countries like India, they need to control money laundering because this particular money is not under the government scanner. And hence the government cannot tax people for this money. Hence the government loses out on a lot of revenue. Also this particular money is obtained through criminal activities. Which means that it is a result of uh, nefarious activities or criminal activities and hence there is a need to stop drug use, there is a need to stop uh, arms sale and all of that. Okay, We will uh, talk about some of the provisions of the PMLA now. The section 3 of the PMLA Act defines the offence of money laundering. It says whosoever involved directly or indirectly attempts to indulge knowingly or unknowingly in an activity connected with the proceeds of crime and projecting it as untainted property shall be guilty. They shall be prosecuted under PMLA. 
and it prescribes the obligation of banking companies they are expected financial institutions are expected intermediaries are expected for the verification and maintenance of records of the identity of all its clients this is the reason why we have kyc done at banks know your customer norms in order to ensure that the money is not laundered money that is coming in into the banking system the pmla empowers certain officers of the directorate of enforcement which is enforcement directorate to carry out investigations in cases involving offense of money laundering and allows to attach uh, the property it envisages designation of one or more courts of sessions why it is a civil offense and hence you use uh, sorry it is a criminal offense and hence you have the sessions court which is designated as a special court uh, to try offenses punishable under pmla there are special courts okay however recently there were some changes under the pmla why okay the pmla as an act was introduced in the year 2005 this was when it was uh, it came into implementation though it was enacted in 2002 it was implemented only in the year 2005 okay now after being uh, implemented uh, it had been modified again in the years 2009 uh and then uh, again further in the years uh, 2012 okay so in as per the 2012 amendment there were certain changes in the original act of 2002 now this particular 2012 amendment it adds the concept of reporting entity which should include a banking company financial institution intermediary etc now these are the entities which need to report proceeds of laundered money okay now the pmla 2002 it levied a fine of up to only rupees 5 lakh but this 2012 amendment act has repo- removed this upper limit also under section 3 of the act mere possession of proceeds of crime is now an offense it means that when one person deposits some money into another's account the other person is also punished say we have two persons person a person b now this person a has done some criminal activity and whatever is the money that he got he has deposited not in his account because he knew that the bank's kyc norms will find him uh, so he deposited the money over here a little bit of the money over here in person b's account now now is person b involved in the criminal act no but he has the money that was Uh, laundered by person a hence even that mere possession of the proceeds of crime it is an offense under money laundering act okay also this 30 lakh threshold limit for initiating money laundering uh, cases for economic offenses is done away with now hence what will happen even cases which are just 10000 rupees or any amount of laundered money can be initiated these cases can be done Okay. Now the penalties also range from three years to seven years, with no upper limit on the value of fines. So the amount of fine can be one crore, it can be ten crores also. There is no upper limit. It depends upon what the special court uh, judge thinks it is. And also, there is no limit uh, regarding no lower limit regarding. There is no sorry. There is no lower limit regarding which cases have to be taken up under PMLA Prevention of Money Laundering Act. okay now okay one more thing that you have to remember is that uh if you see under the pmla while the enforcement directorate is responsible for investigating offenses even the financial intelligence unit fiu under okay which department is this under financial intelligence unit it is under the department of revenue under the ministry of finance sorry this should be mof it is the national agency that receives processes and analyzes information related to suspected financial transactions so you know officers of the financial intelligence unit they are constantly on the lookout they look for these transactions which appear to have been done through criminal intent and they are the ones who reported 
to the enforcement directorate who takes up the investigation part okay please remember this they work hand in hand so pmla is enforced by the fiu plus the ed okay thank you next uh, topic kajuraho temples now where are the kajuraho temples they are in kajuraho where is kajuraho it's in madhya pradesh why are they so important they are so important because uh, these particular uh, temples they were uh, designated as world heritage sites under the unesco in the 1980s itself 1985 i think i'm not uh, too sure but uh, very early and hence you know that particular artistic uh, artistic ability of the temple was recognized by unesco long back now uh these particular uh, renowned artists from around the country will be performing the week long kajraho dance festival okay now please remember some particular topics these are uh, they were constructed by the chandelas of bandelkhand between 850 ad to 1050 ad i am sure you remember that the last great emperor of north india was harsha who ruled till 7th century ad and after that north india split up into multiple units so out of this uh, multiple units that came up many of them were tomars parmaras chauhans similarly chandelas solankis and we and so on and so forth okay so one of them were chandelas now the re, the place where chandelas were ruling was bundelkhand now the kajraho temples are composed of sandstone please remember the reason why they are so heavily decorated is because of sandstone which is a soft stone and they are nearly uh, with a nearly buried granite base the base of the temple you know while this is the kandariya mahadev temple so the lower part is almost buried and this is made up of granite the temples are nagara style architectural symbolism okay please uh, read the basics of nagara style uh, nagara style temple architecture they do not have don't have a pond temple pond don't have a pond they don't have boundary walls they have a shikara which is right above which is right above the garbhagriha okay and then what is the structure of the shikara it is a honeycomb structure yeah and uh, they have uh, right outside the garbhagriha you have uh, statues of uh, rivers you don't have the concept of dwarpala so here and so on please read the other uh, concepts of nagara style temple architecture it will be helpful in the exams okay the vaishnavism vaishnavism school of hinduism the shaivism school of hinduism and jainism all have temples over there in kajuraho it's not just uh, for hinduism alone now regarding these temples it was mentioned in alberuni's work it was mentioned in ivan batuta's work what was alberuni's work al what was ibn batuta so please read all of these things okay were the first to mention the kajraho temples when the chandela kingdom fell uh, the people the muslim invaders who had uh, destroyed the area disfigured the kajraho temples forcing the people to flee kajraho that's how it became uh, the population moved out the kandariya mahadeva temple the most visited temple has a shikara that rises 116 feet and occupies an area of around 6500 square feet so not so important but uh, since this is the most important temple i thought i should name it over here there are also uh, there is the lakshman temple i mean please read the other temples that are there the chandelas were extremely passionate about the performing arts as well as numerous types of music and dance the sculptural representation of varied scenes of music and dancing displayed on the walls of the temples demonstrate this which means that the walls of the temples had a lot of musical and dance instrument music and dance instruments 
and performing arts. Next, classical language status. Like what I spoke earlier, this is a very important thing. Uh, currently in India, we have about six uh, classical, classical languages. Now, what is the reason why it is in the news? The Maharashtra government has been demanding to accord classical language status to Marathi. Now, uh, as per a reply given in the Rajya Sabha by the then Minister of Culture, according to the rules framed, uh, a language needs to satisfy these four criteria in order to be recognized as a classical language. High antiquity of its early texts over a period of 1500 years or 2000 years. It needs to have a long period of early texts. Okay. Next, a body of ancient literature which is considered a valuable heritage by generations of speaker currently. This is currently. Even the people who are existing right now, they should think that these already existing, uh, already existing literature is valuable and they should be referring to it even now. The literary tradition should be original and should not be borrowed from another speech or community. Which means that the reason why Tamil or Telugu or even uh, Odia they are classical languages is because they are original in nature. They have not been borrowed from any other language. They have not been borrowed from, say, Indo-Tibetan languages or Indo-European languages. They are very original. Next, the classical language and literature being distinct from modern, there should be a classical distinction that exists between the olden classical language and the current forms of that particular language. Okay. Next, there may also be a discontinuity between the classical language and its later forms of offshoots. The languages which are already granted the status, uh, try to remember the order. Tamil was the first language to get classical language status, then Telugu, Malayalam, Sanskrit, Kannada, Odia. Okay. Now, benefits of being a classical language. What is the use of being a classical language? One of the uses is that we have two international awards for that particular language which will be given annually. Then a center of excellence for studies in classical languages will be set up. There is a center of excellence for Tamil, for Telugu, all these. And the University Grants Commission which is the regulatory body for universities. Uh, will be requested to create and to start with at least in the central universities a certain number of professional chairs for classical languages for scholars of eminence in classical Indian languages. Now, why should Marathi be considered as a classical language? The state government had established a commission under uh, literature uh, Mr. Ranganath Pathare. And he had prepared a voluminous report citing the ancient nature of the language, originality, you know, the continuity that exists and uh, the fact that a lot of people right now consider, uh, they still refer to the old language that was initially there, the classical language. And hence it should be granted classical language status. Okay, students, one more thing to be remembered over here is that there is one more language which satisfies all the conditions. However, it has not been given classical language status. Pali is not a classical language despite it satisfying all the criteria. Next topic. Data accessibility policy. Like what I told you, I think everyone knows today that data is the new oil okay now based on data people can innovate hence uh, private companies normally look out for data so that they can mine this data and build applications which cater to the needs of people okay the ministry of electronics and information technology has come out with a draft data accessibility and use policy this particular policy proposes to improve data availability, quality and use in line with emerging technology demands. Any data sharing shall happen within the legal framework in India, its national policies and legislation as well as recognized international guidelines. So this particular data sharing shall only happen as per the 
data protection act which means that sensitive data or critical data won't be shared okay won't be shared only anonymous data only anonymous data will be shared under this draft data accessibility and use policy okay next okay all data and information generated created and collected by the central government and authorized agencies shall be covered by the policy so the data that is there under the central government will be either made accessible for use okay all the government data will be open and shareable unless it falls under negative list of data sets what is this negative list of data sets okay now this negative list of data sets can be something related to critical data can be related to sensitive data and uh, and that particular data which is restricted of restricted access will only be shared with trusted users as defined by the respective ministry or department under the controlled environment so ministries and departments will designate certain users as trusted users and only those will be given restricted access to some data okay it proposes the establishment of an indian data office to streamline and unify data access and sharing amongst government and other stakeholders so this shall be the regulatory body for data sharing in case of institutional framework the draft noted that every ministry or department should have data management units headed by chief data officers who will work closely with the indian data office to ensure implementation of this policy so each ministry and each department will have these chief data officers who will decide how much data has to be shared and with who and they'll work with this indian data office in order to share this particular data now indian data council comprising of the indian data office and the chief data officers shall be constituted with the objective of undertaking tasks that require deliberation across ministries uh, departments and state governments now this indian data council it might be a we still have a, we don't have a clear concrete idea what it might be but then it's going to involve officers from the indian data office and the chief data officers and they will consult each other and they'll take an informed decision however what is the problem surrounding this india still does not have a proper data protection act there is no data protection in india currently and hence everything remains very vague also there is a lack of transparency in the consultation and drafting process in order to dra uh, draft this uh, data data accessibility and use policy there was not sufficient consultation with the people and also the policy states that india's ambition of becoming a 5 trillion dollar digital economy depends on its ability to harness the value of data now this means that is is the idea of revenue generation the only important thing does it have more importance than uh, privacy because when you give away data when you share too much of data with the central government has then privacy of the individual is getting affected okay now are you willing to sell it off is the government there to sell data okay okay uh, next we should have a proper balance between generating a good economy with a good good growth rate along with maintaining a good amount of privacy for the citizens because right to privacy is a fundamental right under article 21 okay next not stream to pipeline mm. now what is not stream the not stream is a pipeline that connects russia to germany the reason why it is so important is because europe it depends on a majority of its energy needs on russia russia is one of the largest carriers of crude oil though it's not a part of opec it still has one of the largest amounts of crude oil and natural gas in the world now the western countries showed that they were ready to target russia's huge energy industry as germany halted the nord stream 2 pipeline as uh, it said it was halting halting its certification even though the pipeline has been almost constructed 
its certification has been halted because of Russian actions against Ukraine. Currently, Russia has a pipeline that uh, passes through Ukraine which supplies gas to the rest of Europe. It is believed that once the Nord Stream is constructed, this existing pipeline that is there which runs through Ukraine, this is the pipeline, okay, this might become defunct. And the amount of uh, money that Ukraine makes because of this transit will be lost forever to Ukraine, okay. Now, the Nord Stream 2 is a 1200 kilometer pipeline that runs from Russia to Germany through the Baltic Sea. What is this? This is the Baltic Sea. It will carry 55 billion cubic meters of gas per year. Even the Nord Stream 1 carries, Nord Stream 1 carries 55 uh, billion cubic meters of gas. Okay. Now, it was decided to build this pipeline in 2015. Uh, in the year 2021, the USA had accepted not to sanction Nord Stream 2. Hmm. Okay, do you see this? It, both of them put together, they will supply 110 billion cubic meters of gas a year to Germany. Now, what is the problem of this Nord Stream? It will increase Europe's dependence on Russia for natural gas. Why? Because it will make natural gas very cheap. And hence, Europe will not go for acquiring uh, natural gas from far away Middle East or from across the Atlantic from USA. Why? Because it is cheaper to access it from Russia. Currently, the European Union already relies on Russia for 40% of their gas needs. Now, once the Nord Stream 2 comes up, it will increase as 40%. This will have geopolitical uh, ramifications. They will create, there will be extreme dependency on Russia for uh, gas. As it is, uh, you know, Europe is wary of uh, Russian expansion into it. Russia has a aggressive uh, stand in terms of weaponry towards uh, Europe. Now it will also have mastery in terms of natural gas. Hence, it can have geopolitical ramifications, this particular pipeline. That is the reason why it's so important. The pipeline affects Ukraine as currently there is an existing pipeline between Russia and Europe through Ukraine. Once this Nord Stream 2 pipeline comes up, it will bypass Ukraine and deprive it of transit fees of around $3 billion. It can be a geopolitical win for Russia and it can be catastrophic for United States as it reduces the influence of United States. So, Germany rolling back this uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline has been good for USA. Sea cucumbers. Okay. Uh, please remember that uh, the sea cucumbers, recently a lot of Chinese people have been making business investments in Asia. Uh, so, Chinese hatcheries have come up especially everywhere in uh, Sri Lanka, including the northern part of Ch uh, Sri Lanka, which was the site of the Elam Wars. Even in Jaffna, which is in the northern part, there are Chinese hatcheries which have been cultivating sea cucumbers. Now, sea cucumbers are in high demand in China and Southeast Asia. Sea cucumber in India is treated as an endangered species under Schedule 1. Remember, Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act. Now, what is the what is a sea cucumber? Now, these sea cucumbers are marine uh, creatures, okay. They are marine invertebrates, which means that they do not have a backbone. They are invertebrates that live on the sea floor uh, and found generally in the tropical regions, in hot areas. That is the reason why it is cultivated in Sri Lanka, which is a tropical region. Or cultivated in Tamil Nadu, off the coast of Tamil Nadu, which is a tropical region. Name for their unusual oblong shape that resembles a flat cucumber. You can see the shape over here. They are an integral part of the coral ecosystem as one of the main byproducts of the sea cucumbers is calcium carbonate. Okay, what they do is they filter out the ocean sand. And in this filtering process, one of the byproducts is CaCO2. 
I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, one of the main byproducts is CaCO3, calcium carbonate. Uh, I'm sure you know that corals are nothing but made up of calcium. Uh, corals are a symbiotic relation between okay so uh, yeah now please uh, read about the different type of corals what a fringing reef is what a barrier reef is and what an atoll is they actually go about in a progression While a fringing reef is fringing re fringing reef is usually attached uh, to the island itself, mm, the size of the lagoon between the coral reef and the island is very small. In the case of barrier reef, the size of the lagoon is a little bigger, and in the case of atoll, the island itself has submerged, and the coral reef uh, the coral has formed a circle circular shape, as in the case of Maldives, or in the case of any of the other uh, coral uh, islands that we know. Now, please know that uh, usually these corals are nothing but a symbiotic relationship between coral uh, polyp, sorry, coral polyp and al algae. Usually, this algae is zooxanthellae. Now, zooxanthellae. Now, while this coral polyp is responsible for providing shelter and protection to the algae, the algae is responsible for producing food and nutrients that are required by the coral to keep producing more calcium. Okay, So this calcium carbonate is essential for the survival of the coral reefs. Now these sea cucumbers act like garbage collectors of the ocean world and they recycle nutrients thus playing an important role in keeping coral reefs in good condition. Okay, They act as garbage collectors. And they here help provide nu nutrients to this zooxanthellae and all. Okay. Now, brown sea cucumber is listed as endangered in the IUCN. Black spotted sea cucumber is least concern. And blue sea cucumber, there is not enough data in order to understand. Remember that brown sea cucumber is endangered. Thank you.